chapter of First Thessalonians, and in verses 12 through 22, there's some exhortations to orderly living and obedience. First, Paul deals with a view to elders in verses 12 and 13, and then a view toward others in verses 14 and 15, and we were in that, that section, but in this, uh, he gives six admonitions uh, for all Christians, and the first is to warn the unruly. Second, comfort the feeble-minded. Uh, that's someone who is anxious, who's fearful. Uh, the word literally means small-souled. Uh, someone who's lost heart, become discouraged. Third would be support the weak. Uh, and then fourth, be patient with all. Sometimes difficult to be patient with some people. Uh, sometimes difficult to be patient with people in the Lord's church. Sometimes it's patient, difficult to be patient with those outside of the church. Uh, but be patient with all men. The fifth in verse 15, see that none render evil for evil and that any man but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and all men. None render evil for evil unto any man. Do not be retaliatory. A man's nature, it seems like, is to retaliate, to pay back, especially evil that's been done to him. Uh, good illustration. Watch drivers. I hope I'm not describing any of you as I say these things, but someone real quick cuts you off and see what happens with most drivers. You're ready for, they're ready for a fight. And they are ready to try and get back at that individual and uh, do whatever they can to, to aggravate them and trouble them. And many times improper gestures being made at each other. Uh, well, it was an evil done and the other person now got to retaliate. My grandmother used to say that driving brought out the true nature of people. <laughs> and to, in my observations, there's a lot of truth in that. Uh, or how many of you have ever been driving around a parking lot and you see that one that's close to the door and you rush over there and just and someone steals it from you. The parking space. Oh, yeah. uh, and have you seen the res some of the responses that you get on those things? Uh, as I say, I know I'm not describing any of y'all with any of these things. Uh, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of those that uh, they're funny but uh, in some ways but you know when they're in movies and such they're funnies but but they put those in there because that's the way people are uh we know of situations, I'm sure every one of us, where someone's been shot over driving and someone get mad at them, they do something. Lost a friend in high school that way? Over road rage. Uh, and you know, 
I've seen people try and drive people off the road, try and, uh, you know, that's what happens. Why? Because we haven't learned these principles. You don't pay back evil with evil. You don't render evil for evil. Um, the Christian is to live above that type of lifestyle. Uh, someone turn over to Matthew, the fifth chapter, and verses 38 through verse 42. And read that for us. Ye have heard that it has been said, in eye for an eye and two for two. But I say unto you, that ye resist not evil, but forever shall might be on thy right cheek, turn to him the others also. Keep going. <laughs> and if any man. Okay. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak, cloak also. And also, whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. <laughs> give, give to him that askest thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. Now that begins retaliation, really, is what it's dealing with. You don't retaliate. Uh, you don't, you know, if someone does evil to you, you don't do evil back to them. Uh, someone turn over to Romans 12. That's an opportunity if you conduct yourself like a Christian, maybe to set up a Bible study. Well, that is true if you handle the situation properly. Um, I'll tell you another story in a minute, but... Uh, Romans 12, verse 17 through 21, and somebody read that for us. So many times we allow evil to overcome us instead of overcoming it with good. Um, I said in response to Dale, I'd tell another story. Uh, someone was riding with me and we were going to, and this is one of those parking spaces times. Uh, I was about to turn in and get a pretty good parking spot. And someone rushed in and turned in real quick and right in front of us. person with me, uh, they kind of blew up a little bit and wanted to confront them and everything. And I calmly drove off and found another parking spot and we went in. He told me later that uh, I shamed him by not getting mad and everything. Well, the, one of the reasons I didn't was because I was afraid of what the person might do to him. <laughs> he, he might have gotten into a major fight. Well, no need for that. Uh, but how many people, I know that was that person's reaction. He wasn't even driving. I was. Uh, but how many people get mad and blow up like that? And some are worse. Um, and there's no reason for it. The way I look at it now, if I have to walk a few more steps, well, I need the walking anyway. <laughs> I need the exercise, so, uh, so he did me a favor. Uh, sometimes hard to think that way at the time, though, isn't it? Uh, 
the Christian lives above that type of lifestyle, though, where they get mad and try to get even. Uh, as, <coughs> as the last verse there says, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. If we could learn to do that all of the time, it, change, it starts changing our attitudes. Uh, and along with that being patient to all men, uh, it will change us. Uh, in 1 Peter 3 and verse 9, <clears throat> he uses this phrase, not rendering evil for evil. Or railing for railing. Uh, the railing there would be more speech oriented. You say something bad about me, I'm going to say something worse about you. Huh? Railing. Uh, he says, but contrary wise blessing, knowing that ye are there unto called, that ye should inherit a blessing. Um, but someone insults you, it's hard to say something good about them in return, isn't it? <laughs> and that's what he's saying. You say something good in return for their evil speech. Uh, because it's in our nature to just get back at them. Uh, the word render here say that none render evil for evil. It literally means to give it from and thus to repay or give back. And the word for is the Greek word anti. It means against or instead of, opposed to, in place of. So you do not give back or repay evil for evil, with your evil. Um, the word render, as well, is in the aorist tense. Now, if you've got that little, as Tim calls it, cheat sheet, still, you can look down there and you'll see that aorist tense basic idea is Nobody's got. Kind of point okay. It is that one time point action or completed action. In this context, it would be that one time action. Not even one time do you do this. In other words, you never. A Christian, a Christian <coughs> never repays evil for evil. Not even one time. Uh, <coughs> Brother J. Noel Meredith wrote this, that many of these people had freshly emerged from paganism and this instruction was most appropriate, for the Greeks were remarkable for their undying feuds. The Christians had suffered persecution. And he goes on, the old feeling of wanting to pay back some persecutor when the opportunity offered itself could easily rise in young Christians unless resisted. So if you didn't think, a uh, feud going on and on and on. Uh, reminds me how many of you have seen that Andy Griffith show where there are two families feuding. And so he's going to get to the bottom of it. Why are they feuding? Goes over to one side, I don't know. Goes over to the other side, I don't know. We're feuding because their name's so-and-so. Well, yes, but... Why? Well, because there are such and such name. Uh, yeah, but why are you feuding with them? Or 
serve? Why with them? And, well, we're feuding with them. Never any reason given. But the feud had to be kept on. Tradition. <laughs> that's kind of the way in which Brother Meredith is saying that's the way Greeks were. And many of these that had come out of, uh, out of this was, were Greeks, and they were now Christians. It would apply to them as well, yes. You deal with the Jews there, their feelings were that eye for an eye. Uh, and thus, don't repay evil for evil. Yes, and you're going to get me off on another subject here, but I'll, uh, that's okay. Some want to claim that Jesus was simply explaining the old law. That's not explaining the old law. That's different from the old law. The old law said those things. Some say that, well, those were just the misinterpretations of, the, of what the law said. No, it, they, he quoted the law. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. That's what the law stated. And so, Jesus was just simply saying, that's the way it was. Now then, it's different. You don't have that. That's returning evil for evil. The, there's another aspect of that, though. Let me just add this. Under the law of Moses, you had a uh, theocracy. <laughs> uh, we talk about democracy. We're not a democracy, really, but... Uh, this is where God rules. We are a constitutional republic. Um, but people refer to us as democracy. It was never intended to be a democracy. Uh, but we talk about democracy, that would be majority rule of the people. Theocracy is God ruling. Uh, God's own. So he has in the, in, set up in the mosaic system his laws from a governmental standpoint as well. And so from a governmental standpoint, there were certain things which they would do. Uh, that would certainly include the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. Now then, you're not under a theocracy those things would not be applicable because you're under some other type of system, whether it be monarchy, uh, constitutional republic, de democracy, whatever it might be. Uh, and so you have governmental things as far as God setting forth the government of the Jews. Now then, he has given that to the, as Paul puts it, higher powers, Romans 13, 4, which would be the government governing authorities. Uh, I'll give an illustration. <laughs> uh, Romans 1, and I think it's verse 32, that people who do certain things are worthy of death, not only who do them, but have pleasure in them. They're worthy of death. Does that mean we should take them out and kill them? Why not? God said they're worthy of death. <laughs> no, he there are certain things that the government is authorized to do and the government is to punish evildoers 
and it would be the government's responsibility to take care of those matters, not our responsibility. That's the difference. Um, no. No. The, God does not, you know, or we're not under a theocracy today because God is not the government. If he was, well, that would be a different matter then, <laughs> but he's not. Uh, that's what you have in the Old Testament, and that's why they would take out, for example, certain individuals and execute them. And their execution was stoning. There were... 20 some odd different things which if they did they would be taken out and stoned um, because God put it in the law of Moses why? because he was ruling from a government standpoint to take those things now and say well we should take someone and execute them well that's the government's responsibility at this point in time not the churches, not individuals. Um, and that's why the individual can give themselves over to allow God to take care of it. If the government doesn't take care of it now, we can expect God will in the hereafter. Um, and so it states of Christ uh, basically that idea that uh, he didn't re bring, uh, when he was reviled, he did not revile back, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Well, that would be to God. And knowing that God would handle the situation in his manner, in his time frame. Wouldn't that be one way God takes Yes. God uses the government to take vengeance. And whether that vengeance is a execution, put that way, or whether it is just uh, some other type of punishment, putting them in jail for a certain time. Um, I would say public beatings, but uh, that may sound a little bit harsh, but... Uh, uh, there are certain ways in which the government can bring about punishment. Well, they, that was unjust, though. The government's responsibility is to uphold good and punish the evil. They weren't doing that. Um, but we... As far as we are concerned, we give ourselves over to doing good. And so that's the next thing. Follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. The word follow is a word that Zohitis defines as to follow or press hard after to pursue with earnestness and diligence in order to obtain, to go after with the desire of obtaining. A pressing hard to go after and obtain something and that that person is doing. We follow after. Um, Thayer adds, figuratively, of one who in a race runs swiftly to reach the goal. So it's a, in a sense a figurative statement of here's somebody running with all of their effort, running fast to reach the goal. Uh, that's the idea of follow. That's the way we're to do with good. What is it? We excuse uh, evil. And we do good uh, in reality. Um, 
it is used, this word follow, in a negative way. It's not always a positive way. Uh, in Acts 8, we have Saul. He made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committing them to prison. He was following after evil to put Christians in prison. But you see in that his great desire to do it. He was following that type of lifestyle. And we find in chapter 9 he goes in to the chief priest and he says, give me letters that I can go as far as Damascus, and if I find anyone who's a Christian, I'm going to bring them back here to be, basically be put to death. That's someone who is following that type of a system, a lifestyle. Um, and so you see in chapter 9 and verse 1 of Acts, and Saul yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples, went into the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogue, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound to, unto Jerusalem. So there's a negative aspect that it can be used in, in relationship to evil, following after evil. Uh, and that was certainly Saul at that time. But it can also be used in a positive way. As is seen here, you follow that which is good. Um, it is following or seeking after eagerly, eagerly. And thus we pursue good. We strive for good. We aspire to good. Uh, it is also in the present tense, which means what? Present tense is continuous action. You continue to follow. After what happens so many times? We get we become so eager and we are so dedicated and over a period of time that fire that was in us, that excitement, that desire to follow after good, it starts dwindling, doesn't it? And we don't do it anymore. Okay, with with Paul, they were, but. Um, to keep that, to keep the flame going. Uh, but there's the old story of the preacher who visited a member who had fallen away. And he sat down on the hearth and he just got some tongs and got a ember that was red hot and took it and set it away f aside from the fire and what did it have to do? Went out. Great illustration. When you separate yourself from that, you're going to go out. Um, and so yes, we have these times that we set up to stoke the flame a little bit more, keep it going good and strong. Uh, word good, there's a couple of different Greek words that are translated good. Vine says of this one, 
that it describes that which being good in its character or constitution is beneficial in its effect. In other words, it's good intrinsically. You do things that are good intrinsically. And thus, those things are going to be beneficial to others. Uh, it's not enough simply to abstain from evil. A lot of times, that's where we end the discussion. Abstain from evil. That's not enough. You have to then positively do good. If you don't follow through with that doing of good, then you're only halfway there. You're not really doing what God wants. Um, we're going to do those things that will benefit others. First Peter 3 and verse 11 states, Let him eschew evil and do good. Let him seek peace and ensue it. So you turn away, you eschew evil, you do good. Positively, or positive, beneficial good to others. In Matthew 7 and verse 12, you might remember what that one is. What we call it? Golden. That's the golden rule, as we refer to it. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. Now, Jesus would be the perfect example of this. As you look at the life of our Lord, he, well, Peter describes it in, uh, when he goes to Cornelius in Acts 10 and verse 34, that he went about doing good and healing all that were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. He went about doing good. And as you look at his life, you see that that is the epitome of his life. Uh, that's the way we should be. But one other aspect of this, this is to be done toward Christians and toward the unbelieving world. Notice both among yourselves well, that would be Christians. And to all, the men is italicized, it's implied in the text, all men. Can you imagine anyone reading this and coming away with the conclusion that both among yourselves means only the Christians that are there, and then to all being Christians every place else? No? Can't imagine anyone reading it that way. <laughs> well, they have. Turn over to Galatians 6 and verse 10. As we therefore have opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially them who are the household of faith. So they, in order to teach this doctrine, false doctrine, let me put it, of you, can, or you cannot help someone out of the church treasury unless they are a Christian. The only ones that you can help out of the church treasury have, been, have to be Christians. And they come across this, some of them, in order to defend that doctrine, will read it and say, well, the all there deals with Christians everywhere, while the household of faith deals with those who are close by and, and that he was dealing with at that time. So it's Christians and Christians. 
Let's do good unto Christians and unto Christians. <laughs> well, that's especially these Christians as opposed to the other Christians. <laughs> you have to do a whole lot of mental gymnastics to come up with that idea. Uh, so many times what, uh, what happens is that somebody will come up with a doctrine and here's a verse that clearly teaches otherwise and so what do they do? They have to reinterpret this verse somehow so that they can hold on to their do false, false doctrine. That's what these people did. Um, is it sinful to help someone who is not a Christian out of the church treasury? Of course not. Uh, it is a doing of good, both among yourselves and all men. Um, the other thing in which they argued Galatians 6 and verse 10 is that that is individual action. It is not out of the church treasury. So therefore, as you have therefore opportunity to do good, let us do good unto all men, especially them of the household of faith, that that is only individual action. So I could take and out of my own pocket help someone who's not a Christian, but the church cannot do that. Except what in reality they do is they conclude that it is sinful for the church to do that. The church sins and they, well, one individual signed a debate proposition, debated it. Uh, this is way back years ago, decades ago that if the church took even one dime out of the church treasury to help a starving baby, that they would go to hell. Um, now then, I'll say those who want to debate the subject don't want to debate that. But that is the position that they hold. They just don't want to debate it that way. Because it becomes so obvious. I mean, that is so evil. Uh, uh, in... And these two verses, really, it's, it's toward others. Is that just individuals toward other individuals, or is it, could it be the church or apply to the church as well? Should, let you go back toward these things. Should the church warn the unruly? Should the church comfort the feeble-minded? Should the church support the weak? Should the church be patient toward all men? Should the church be non-retaliatory? Should the church follow that which is good? Now say to take that, the, the position of the uh, saints only position, that's what it's called. You have to say that it's sinful for the church to do those things. And if you go back to Galatians 6 and you start in verse 1 and go through, there are several things that we're to do. They're saying and they're teaching it's the, it is sinful for the church to do any of those things. Um, but I continue to try and get an answer from any of them if they will define the church treasury. Does it apply simply to money or does it apply to assets as well? For example, that pew that you're sitting in, 
Is that part of the church treasury? Did the church pay for those pews? And when we repatted them and put new uh, coverings on, did the church pay for those things? It did, out of the church treasury. And that's out of the church treasury. Does Do those pews now become part of the church treasury? Just not a monetary asset, or as they would put it, liquid asset? Well, yes, it's still a part of the church treasury. Thus, no non-Christian can be helped by those pews. Someone who's a non-Christian, we better not let them sit down. Uh, but did the church buy the chair? <laughs> They've got to bring their own chair. Of course, uh, what about the air conditioning? Who paid for it? The church? Who pays for the bills for it? The church? <laughs> I'm, I'm showing the error of that doctrine. I'm showing the error of the doctrine. So they can't, a non-Christian cannot even come in the building and enjoy the air conditioning. We'll have to keep them outside. Uh, that would be the, church, the water from the church. Um, defining what the treasury is. But then if you start getting into situations, here's a young couple. Let's say they're struggling. Both the husband and wife are members of the church. And they're struggling. Can we help them out of the church treasury? Oh, well, sure we can. Oh, but wait. What if they've got a small baby? Oh, wait. That small baby's not a member of the church, is it? He's not a saint. Okay. Uh, just wait. Uh, well, if they've got a small baby, the small baby's not a member of the church. He's not a saint. So now then we can't help, cannot help that family if any of that money would go to the small baby. How ridiculous is that? What if one of them is a member of the church and the other one's not? Can we help them? You've got then, now then, the church going to help someone who's a Christian, but it also is going to help someone who's their mate who's not a Christian. Hmm. Can't help that individual. So there's... This idea of saints only is it just, it's a ridiculous doctrine. It's uh, a horrible, horrible doctrine. But that's our responsibility to others, to do good unto all men. And also among ourselves, yes, but to all men. We'll start there, Lord willing, next week with verse 16, with a view towards self.